So we stopped last time with an expression for the orbit. And this is the Schwarzschild radius as a function of the azimuthal angle. And this describes the whole orbit because we know that the polar angle can be established to be constant. And this equation for the orbit will tell us something about the path of the planet in space around a star. So there's a lot of questions. First of all, you know, we'd like to know, can the path be a circle? Can the path be an ellipse, which is sort of what it is in Newtonian mechanics? Can the, does the, if it is an ellipse, does it precess, which is, of course, we know it better because that's the famous result of general relativity, but it could precess maybe really rapidly. Unlike Mercury's little sort of piddly precession, it could precess like something like this. It could do, you know, something totally crazy where each, each orbit, it's like 30 degrees precessed or more. In fact, it turns out we can make an arbitrary amount of precession if we fine-tune the orbit. Um, another question we might ask is, what about unbounded orbits, right? If we have an unbounded orbit, typically we know them to be hyperbolas in Newtonian mechanics. What's the difference in the Schwarzschild geometry? Um, can the orbits cross in the Schwarzschild geometry? Could an orbit come in like this and come around and then go out like that? The answer is yes. And in fact, you can make this crossing crazy degenerate and you can get an orbit that goes around several times and then plunges in. Or it goes around several times and then escapes. You can actually do all of these things in the Schwarzschild's geometry and you can't do any of them. Uh, just ellipses that don't process and circles and hyperbolas that come in and come out. That's it. That's all you can do with Newtonian, the Newtonian orbital uh, analysis for the central force problem in Newtonian space. Nevertheless, in order to study and understand this guy, meaning take to tease apart the differential equation that generates this and give us all this information about these orbits, we're going to have to really go back and review Newtonian mechanics of the central force problem and orbits there because everything really is referred to those things. And we've already done a bunch of stuff. We probably should have done this first because when we introduced, for example, when we introduced, uh, what it was it, chi uh, is 1 over the reduced uh, Schwarzschild radius, that is a step that's taken in the central force problem in Newtonian mechanics. And I, I think I alluded to the idea, you remember this from classical mechanics, but that's a little unfair. Because when we think about studying general relativity, we should be thinking about an intellectual timeline that starts with, uh, you know, basic mechanics, mechan mechanics, which would be like Newton's laws, right? Newton's laws. And then it goes from that to essentially uh, advanced mechanics, which to me, uh, advanced mechanics, you're really talking about the Lagrangian, right? The Hamiltonian, the Lagrangian, the Hamiltonian formalisms. Then you get to really advanced mechanics, so that would be advanced advanced mechanics, and here you're doing the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, Hamilton-Jacobi formalism, which usually, I got to say, usually if you're in advanced series, you that all comes kind of together in sequence. It definitely goes from this to this to that, but... Um, you don't usually have to take a separate class to get to the advanced, advanced stuff. And then um, from there, then you kind of head off to general relativity. Actually, you got special relativity in here, right? You got special relativity first, and then general relativity. And you better have in parallel a track for electromagnetism, right? So this would be you know, basic, um, basic, what would I say, uh, 
basic um, basic E and M, and then somewhere along the top line you get into the full vector form vector form of Maxwell's equations, right? And then advanced D and M might be uh, uh, wave propagation, wave propagation. Uh, uh, the uh, various uh, waveguide solutions. I don't know how advanced that is. I mean, you do this in your second course. You don't do waveguides in your down here. That's for sure. And then somewhere along the line, those two link up, right? And you really you can't you cannot understand special relativity unless you're linking up these two courses of of intellectual uh, activity. Because you and because you can't understand special relativity effectively without a good basis in electricity and magnetism. You can you and special relativity is the foundation, the flat space of general relativity. You really can't understand general relativity without understanding E and M ultimately, even if all you're talking about is a orbiting planet around uh, a star or a central mass. So this is sort of the overall journey. What we've done is we're here, right? We're we're way out here. So there's a presumption that you guys know all this. However, at the same time, this is a lot to ask. It's a lot to ask that you go boom, 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 in parallel, and then pop here. And you never have to revisit these things. The truth of the matter is you always have to revisit these things. And in fact, in fact, you should be thankful of the opportunity to be here and say, you know what? I better go back and check out those things again. Because I, first of all, I probably got them okay the first time I was up to a speed, took a test, moved on. Now is the time to go back and relearn. You, you've, you've, been, you've forgotten them, and now you're going to go back and learn them the second time. And that's when you learn things. You learn things the second time you hear about them. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I can review all of this stuff effectively and, and give you the benefit of that second pass. But I do plan to take this lecture to, uh, to talk about the central force problem in, at this level right here, probably more at this level. I don't know if I'll do the Hamilton-Jacobi, but definitely these two, right? The Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian formalism for the central force problem. And uh, that is, will be a precursor to the final analysis of this problem uh, with the Schwarzschild geometry and general relativity. And... Basically, I want you to take a think about it as your chance to go back and refresh yourself on these things. Open up that old mechanics book and dig into these two formalisms because basically, if you really are going to keep going with this story, right, this story, uh, this is only one place where these things pop together. The, the next place, of course, is quantum mechanics. I guess I need a green line where actually you've gone through all of this and now you go right here into quantum mechanics. There's no elementary quantum mechanics course. There's, there's a few classes that will teach you, like, ah, I don't know, I, I think chemistry is like your elementary quantum mechanics, where you, you know, you've got your atom and you're filling the electron shells with the, those rules, but Jesus, who, I mean, that's basically like, might as well be science for poets, right? That's crazy. So your quantum mechanics, your elementary quantum mechanics requires uh, requires, I guess, let's see, I'm, I'm, it sh you should probably have, you definitely need to get through your Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formatism, maybe even Hamilton-Jacobi's equations, but let's say at least here, right, at least here, you got to come out to get into your quantum mechanics class, and then I'm trying to do this sort of prerequisite thing, right, and then your advanced quantum mechanics class, uh, which is field theory, which now does start requiring all of these things together. Anyway, the point is, is reviewing the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formalism in, this, in any specific example, but the central force in particular, um, is never a bad idea. And it seems boring because now we're going back to like, this is like Newtonian stuff. But what I remember it differently. I remember all of a sudden, you know, taking this studying Lagrangian mechanics, and all of a sudden, a problem in regular mechanics that we worked hard to solve, like this regular swinging pendulum, right? All of a sudden, you could solve a problem where you have, like, 
three pendulums swinging all together. And this mount up here isn't fixed. Like this is like frictionless. Friction, no friction, right? So this thing is like moving freely this way or that way. And then you have these different pendulums and each one of these might be a different mass, right? And then the rod itself might have uh, actual mass per length, right? It's not like a string where you ignore every, um, the weight of the string. I mean, you, I mean, all of a sudden the problems you could, I mean, shit, you could attach a freaking, let's see, what could you do? You could, you could put a wheel on this thing practically and that could be constrained to move on a plane of some sort. God, I, I don't know. You could do anything practically once you start working in the Lagrangian formalism. And all of a sudden, I was thinking, this is actually really, really interesting. And so uh, so I was glad to be able to go back and review this a little bit. And I'm just trying to motivate you to pay some attention to the possibility of going back and restudying this as part of your work towards general relativity. Now, what we're going to do now in this lesson is we're going to review the Lagrangian formalism and apply it to the central force problem and solve for some orbits. And uh, we're going to do that uh, because I want to do something similar with, uh, well, when we go back and start finishing up the differential equations uh, from general relativity, the differential equations that not only give us this, but also give us uh, the other parameters as well, like the proper time with respect to this orbit and other things. Um, uh, I want to be able to refer back to the concepts of, uh, of, of the central force problem. In particular, the thing to understand in the Schwarzschild case is we need to get to an idea of understanding the effective potential. Right? The effective potential actually shows up in the general relativity problem, of uh, the Schwarzschild problem. And uh, it really, in order to jump into it, you've got to remember what the effective potential is in the context of the central force problem. Otherwise, it's kind of a, it's, it's a bit of a hand-wavy thing. Okay, so uh, let's begin this review. This all starts with a sort of a miraculous function, a function called the Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian operates, is, is a function of the, what we call generalized coordinates. And there can be as many as you want of them. And the generalized velocities. And we usually discern them as Q. And the Lagrangian always has the option of also being an explicit function of time. And so time in the Lagrangian acts as an independent parameter of just a variable that the Lagrangian may or may not be a function of, but it's definitely a function of these coordinates. And the coordinates describe the position or the structure or the arrangement of all the uh, masses or objects in your problem. And the collection of coordinates that describe the problem is the configuration of the problem. So the coordinates describe the configuration of the problem. And what you know, what you should remember, if I can remind you about my maybe my double pendulum block, right, where where I had one pendulum and then another pendulum, you know, and and everything's specified, right? This is all constrained here. I could say that the position of this block relative to some reference marker, the position of this, let's say, the reference marker, some wall over here, that position of the marker that might be Q one, right? the position of the block. And the block is free to move, right? The block is free to move this way or, or that way. But its position is Q1. Now, Q1 is certainly a function of time. And then the pendulum, how to describe that? Well, we presume, of course, that we know the system. So we know that, that this first length, this mass, I'll call that length 1, mass 1, length 2, mass 2. And then we remember that this uh, second coordinate might very logically be this angle, and a third coordinate might be this angle. I'll call it Q3, right? So with three coordinates, Q1, Q2, and Q3, I can create a Lagrangian, Q1, Q2, Q3, and the Lagrangian will be a function of those coordinate values, and remember, each of these, Q1 is a function of time, 
q2 is a function of time and q3 is a function of time. And therefore, there's also the velocities, which are also functions of time. Uh, q2, q3. And the Lagrangian is a function of these velocities, too. q3 and time. The Lagrangian also may be a function of time explicitly. And if I can... So the question is, is understanding the nature of this Lagrangian is, is actually really trippy. I, it's sort of like a miracle function. If you know the Lagrangian of the system, then you can find the equations of motion of the system. And the equations of motion are the goal. We want those equations of motion. So what is an equation of motion? Well, look, I want to know, I mean, ultimately, I want to know how this system moves. This is my system, right? This double pendulum swinging under a mass. I guess I should give this mass a, a letter, capital M. How about that? Um, uh, so I want to know how this thing moves. I want to say, hey, if I started in some configuration, maybe if I just had this stationary, I bent this over 30 degrees and I bent this over five degrees, and then I just let it go, right? How would this mass move back and forth with respect to time. I'm guessing it would move back and forth because this is going to swing in some way. And it's, when it swings one way, it's going to push this one way. And when it swings the other way, it's going to push it the other way. And, you know, the center of mass is probably not going to change. Or, But, but um, uh, I want the equations of motion. That means I want to know what is, what is this function, right? What is, what is this guy? What is Q1 with respect to time? If I tell you the time, can you tell me how far this block is? If I tell you the time, can you tell me what angle this swing is at? If I tell you the time, can you tell me what angle this swing is at? And if you can, then I can say, oh, so I've got a certain time. I find out where the block is. I put my block there, right? Maybe, maybe the block is here at some time, t. So I move it over to Q... Uh, to q1 of t0, say I'm interested in the time t0, and then I find out that q2 is this negative angle, angular value, so this is q2 of t0, and then I find that uh, q3 is something like that, right? So there's q3 of t0. And then I draw this thing, and now I know that the whole system is in this green configuration at t0. Then if I want some other time, I put some other time in there. But if I know the equations of motion, then in principle, I should learn these functions. The equations of motion themselves are equations that, that uh, involve these three functions, the solutions of which are the actual values of these functions. So there are going to be some differential equation that involves these guys here. And um, if I can solve those equations of motion, I'll know the q, q2, q3 at every time, and their derivatives will tell me how fast everything is changing at that moment. So the Lagrangian, inside the Lagrangian, buried inside this thing, are all of the equations of motion. And if I can extract those equations of motion and then solve those equations of motion, I basically understand everything there is to know about this system for all time in the future. So this is sort of a magic little creature this function, and it's really cool, and um, uh, strangely enough, there's a lot of reasons, there's a lot of ways of figuring out how to calculate the Lagrangian. Some are very simple, in fact, we learn, we learn them for most uh, common, for typical, certain kinds of systems, we learn them right away. In fact, we know that the formula, if we remember, I'm counting on you to remember some of this, right? It's the kinetic energy, which is often given by T, minus the potential energy, in circumstances when the Lagrangian itself is not an explicit function of time, right? If it turns out that this T can be omitted, then this kinetic energy minus the potential energy is uh, the Lagrangian. Under the circumstances also that um, the potential energy, that the forces on this object, any forces on this, on our system, are all derivable from a potential, meaning that any force that acts on our system must ultimately be um, 
derived from uh, uh, d some potential u dt. Wait, 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 what am I saying? That's not right. The force must be the gradient of some potential, a conservative force, right? If that's the case, then the Lagrangian is just the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. Now, there's, some, there's still one other caveat, which means, which is that you, these coordinates, you have, to, you have to calculate this kinetic energy in an inertial system. And in Newtonian mechanics, that means a stationary system or a system in uniform motion relative to, basically relative to absolute space. So that's very important, because remember, this is Newtonian mechanics, so we can talk about sort of absolute space, and time is a marching parameter that's the same for everybody. Um, but so the Lagrangian, and the ones we've learned about and studied about are pretty easy to get a handle on. Um, but, uh, but the point being that the, the, but the true ultimate definition of what is a Lagrangian for a system is if you, if you know what the equations of motions are, any Lagrangian that can, through a specific procedure uh, called uh, 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 Hamilton's principle, any function that can generate the correct equations of motion is a legitimate Lag Lagrangian for the system. Okay, so we're now going to talk about this in terms of the central force problem. All right, so what's the setup of the central force problem? Well, about the easiest possible problem you can imagine. You've got a center of force, and there is a potential field around this center of force such that all forces are applied in the direction, say a force is applied on some particle there, that force must be applied towards the center or away from the center. It's central in the sense that it either goes directly, it's, a, it's an attractive force directly towards the center or a repulsive force directly away from the center. And the way this is expressed mathematically is we are going to call this a conservative force, by the way. We're, that's part of our, our story here. And we're going to say that this force, this central force, is derivable from a potential u, but that u is only a function of r. And therefore, this central force is going to basically be minus, we'll say, I'll say partial u, partial r, because none of the other derivatives exist. In fact, you could say du dr if you wanted to. We'll stick with the partials for now. In fact, I'll just remind you that when I write the gradient of a function, right, say the gradient of a function of u, uh, that gradient would be, in, in this is classical mechanics now, right? We're not talking about our, our vector spaces and everything, but it's the unit direction. I guess I could do a little bit of what we did before. The unit vector in the x direction, say, I'll make it look like that, times the partial of u with respect to x plus the unit direct vector in the y direction with the partial of u with respect to y plus the unit vector in the z direction, partial u with respect to z. That would be the Cartesian coordinates. And you can remember in the... Uh, but this can be done in spherical polar coordinates, which is what we should consider, which would be er du dr plus... Uh, let me think here for a second... Um, 1 over r, the coordinate value r, partial of u, partial, partial, I think it's theta, plus, um, oops, um, and then this is the, the unit vector in the theta direction, or, yeah, in the theta direction, and then... 1 over r sine theta partial u partial phi, the azimuthal vector, times this guy in the phi direction. But once we stipulate that u is a function only of r, if these guys go away, and all you have is this, so you have the, uh, that's the gradient of u, and now the force equals minus the gradient of u, so the force is going to equal minus this guy, right? And these guys just go to zero. So the force will always be, that's what we mean by a central force. Now in the uh, GR problem, we don't have a central force, right? Everything is attracted to the center, but it's attracted to the center, not because there's a force pulling it, but because it's geodesic motion, 
its motion in, in space-time is such that the spatial projection of the motion makes it bend, uh, makes it uh, 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 follow a track through space-time that drags it into the center of the force, but the uh, center of, of the symmetry of the problem. But there's no force that pulls, and that's the very big distinction. In, in Newtonian mechanics, you've got this force, you've got this potential, and the potential is a bit of a mystery. It's just presumed. There's this thing called gravity, and it operates in a certain way, and it turns out that gravity is central. It's a central force, so it's derivable from a uh, the gradient of some potential, so we create a gravitational potential field to describe it, and, and that's what Newtonian mechanics is. Um, General relativity tries to say, you know, that's so arbitrary. Creating some field that mathematically creates a uh, 1 over square central force. I don't know. You're postulating all these things, and it sure does a good job of predicting. Don't get us wrong. But how about space-time bends? Everything just sort of moves normally around its sort of local uh, experience of space-time. And in the aggregate, that just tends to draw you to the center of gravity. So there's two fundamental different positions here. Oddly enough, in the Schwarzschild geometry case, a lot of the mathematics is very, very related. Of course, that would have to be because uh, Newtonian mechanics must be the ultimate limit of general relativity in for small masses and other, other things. Okay, so um, the central force problem involves this, uh, this, potential, uh, this potential, which means it's got a potential energy. Now, the kinetic energy of a particle, no matter who, who, where it is, say there's some particle moving in this direction, that kinetic energy is always going to be one-half mv squared, where v is actually a vector. When I write v squared, I'm saying take the magnitude of that vector and square it. So, that's a, uh, so this is a scalar, right? It's not a, uh, it's not a vector. It's a scalar. This is a vector expression, right? because it ends up being a vector in the classic Newtonian sense, which is also a vector in our what is a tensor sense, but nevertheless, um, uh, the, um, but, but, but uh, it's, it's a, got, we got to go back to thinking about our standard mechanics here for this problem. So this one-half mv squared could be one-half, or m over 2, x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared, but we're going to write it as r dot squared plus um, r squared theta dot squared plus r squared sine squared theta uh, phi dot squared, right? So it's in spherical coordinates. And you can work that out yourself but, you know, a particle in spherical coordinates, its velocity is clearly going to, if its radial position is r, notice I'm not using rho anymore because we're in the Euclidean Newtonian system, but it r, certainly r dot squared one-half m r dot squared is going to be a certain angular momentum in the direction, the radial direction. In this direction here, this sort of, I guess if we call this angle phi, this direction you're going to have phi dot squared r squared for the uh, velocity. Um, uh, well, I guess we should call that one theta, because I'm using theta to be the uh, polar angle, right? So for, if we call that theta, and say this is the z-axis, and usually theta is this guy here, right? So, so if that's the z-axis and this is then this then the angle theta in the in the case that I've drawn it, uh, the angle theta is is ninety, right? So, uh, so this would end up being r squared theta dot squared, and then there's a uh, uh, azimuthal angle, right? This guy that would be that's phi, and phi will be r squared sine squared theta phi dot squared. <clears throat> And that's what this is. So this is all m over 2 times these guys. And that is the uh, kinetic energy. So if the kinetic energy is this, the potential energy is going to be the gravitational potential energy if it's gravity. But we're just going to talk about an arbitrary central force problem. So I'm going to write the Lagrangian of our central force problem is going to be 1 half m times r dot squared plus 
r squared theta dot squared plus r squared sine squared theta phi dot squared minus u. So I'm stipulating when I write the Lagrangian in this form, I'm going through a whole bunch of assumptions. And let me make sure we list them all out for you. The, um, the first is that the particle is not constrained, right? We're not forcing this guy on a loop or on a wire right now, right? It's, it's kind of free to go. Um, uh, it's unconstrained in these coordinates, in the coordinate system that we're using. Um, the other is that um, uh, the, this, this potential here, this potential has to be time independent, right? U can be a function of the coordinates, which in this case would be r, theta, and phi, but it can't be a function of time. And um, it also must be conservative. We're talking about a conservative force. So we know that the force is acting on the particles minus the gradient of U, and U is not a function of time. If u is a function of time, if the potential is a function of time, that means we're kind of putting things into the system and taking them out, and that requires energy, so we're adding energy in and out of the system, and that um, complicates the Lagrangian. It's certainly possible. We can absolutely, this formalism we'll learn can handle that, but for this particular situation, when you have a conservative potential, I'm sorry, conservative force, and... Um, uh, then the Lagrangian is simply the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. Now, it turns out that statement is true even for a broader variety of potentials, um, so-called velocity-dependent potentials, which uh, we probably won't need to talk about here or review here, but it is definitely true for that particular circumstance I just mentioned. So now let's have a look at Hamilton's principle and how to get equations of motion out of this thing. Now the equations of motion are famously, and again this should be slightly familiar, the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to QI, I'll, I'll put it in this way, equals the derivative, the full derivative with respect to time of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q I dot. Even engineers know this. Uh, engineering mechanics uh, covers this subject because they like to solve those complicated pendulum-like problems, right? And this is really the only way to do it. This is an equation of motion. This is Lagrange's equation. And if you have the Lagrangian, and remember, I'll write down that the Lagrangian is a function of Q1 through Qn, Q dot 1 through Q dot n, and possibly time. Now, the Lagrangian is always a function of time because Q1 is a function of time, and Q all the way through Qn is a function of time. So likewise, these derivatives, right, are functions of time, right? So the Lagrangian is always a function of time through the fact that the generalized coordinates are functions of time. The possibility exists, however, that the Lagrangian is in itself a function of the time as well. And um, this kind of uh, fact, this kind of explicit time dependence happens like, remember this double pendulum when we had this block sliding on a plane and underneath it was the, the double pendulum, right? Um, like this. If, if I have some force applied, a constant force applied to this pendulum so that it's, there's a steady force pulling on the pendulum, um, that's going to drive, uh, that's going to drive a, a explicit time dependence into the problem. And uh, that's, that's a non, that's sort of an exterior force being applied into the problem. And that will cause, that's an example of how you can get this, this time dependence in there. Um, I'm trying to think of another way. Well, usually you see basically steady accelerations. You know, some maybe I'll have a, a spinning disk of some kind, right? And there's a bunch of physics going on this on top of this disk. But I assert that this disk has a steady angular uh, 
uh, acceleration of some sort, that, or that there's a, a torque constantly being added onto this disk. Things like that uh, uh, put explicit time dependence into the Lagrangian, but we won't be considering that for now. The point is, though, is that this, uh, this Lagrangian, um, you can take, it's a function of the configuration and of the velocities, the generalized coordinates and the generalized velocities. So you can take a derivative with respect to a generalized coordinate, you can take the derivative of this object with respect to the velocities, and you can always take the time derivative, whether or not it's a function of time, because it's always a function of time through these guys. So there's a lot of chain rule happening when you uh, take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to time. Because even if it's, even if it is an explicit function of time, it's also an implicit function of time, and you still have to take the chain rule each time. So this guy is the equation of motion. Once you have this thing, you can get the equations of motion by robotically executing that. The problem is, is that if you don't remember where this came from, it's kind of an ad hoc bit of a mystery. So let's quickly review how to get this by just studying a general Lagrangian which that only has q, q dot, right? q, q dot, and uh, how about t? We'll, we'll include t. And uh, we'll study it for one variable. For two, you just kind of add it up, right? You just do it for each one independently. It's not, I think the difference is a summation gets added in there. Um, but let's, let's derive, let's derive this thing from this Lagrangian. And of course, to do that derivation, you have to start with some kind of presumption, some kind of uh, physical theory. And that physical theory is Hamilton's principle. So Hamilton principle has a start with this integral. It says it wants us to take the Lagrangian, put it in an integral between the, t the initial time and the final time, and create that integration, or create that integral, that definite integral. We'll call it J for right now. It may, you may think that's a T, but it's meant to be a J, like that, a J. And what we're going to try and do is we're going to say that the actual path that this thing takes um, between T1 and T2 is the path that minim well that makes this integral stationary, which means the value of the integral doesn't change if you change the path a little bit. Now, what are we talking about the path? Well, the path, of course, is q of t. We, that's what we want. We want to know q of t, because that's the path. So we're looking for the path that, when inserted into the Lagrangian through q and q dot, um, that path gives you a stationary value of j, which means a small adjustment of the final path will not change L uh, to at least first order. So this is the drawing you typically see with this analysis. Q1, at time 1, the value of Q is Q1. Don't confuse that with the Q different generalized coordinates. I'm now just specifying a value of Q, and I'm calling it Q1. At Q1, you get time 1. In fact, why don't I, just to eliminate any possibility, I'll change that to Q0 and T0, and I'll make this Q1 and T1, because there's no zeros in that other list, right? So at Q0, T0, the system, the, the value of Q at T0 is right there. The value of q at t1 is up here. The question is, what are the values of q for all the times between t1 and t2? So the system will evolve according to physics, and we're going to say that this black line, that's the actual evolution of the system. That's what nature solves this problem to be, and the value of q with respect to time is this black curve. The idea of, of um, minimizing this integral means that if I chose some alternative path that went like this, a little bit a little bit more rapid change in the beginning and a slower change at the end, or if I went like this, a little bit of a slower change in the beginning and then a rapid change at the end, those two paths, if I inserted them into this integral, that this, the value of this integral is going to change. It's going to become, uh, uh, it's, well, it's going to change because it's a different path. Hamilton's principle basically tells us that this path is a path where if I change just a little bit the, the actual path, not much, just a little bit, this value doesn't change to first order. 
And the same is true, you know, well, well, in other words, it's stationary. It's stationary. As you change the path, this value remains the same. Now, of course, it doesn't literally remain the same because it will change to higher orders, um, but it can be made arbitrarily small by keeping this path very, very close to the true path. So how do we quantify this? Well, we talk about Q. We talk about Q of T as the correct path. We're going to talk about uh, uh, the variation being a variation by a small amount. That small amount will be captured by the value of a parameter. We'll call that parameter alpha. So QT alpha represents a variation from the correct path T, a different path, and the path is somehow captured by alpha, this other parameter. And we're going to define that as QT of 0 plus alpha times some other function of time. And this other function of time is, we'll call it, uh, I guess, uh, what am I calling it here, eta. So this QT of 0 is the true path. It's just what we were calling Q of t. Alpha is a small number, a real number, and eta of t is some other function of time that will add in to the true path at, a, at, 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 at an amount um, uh, metered or throttled by alpha. Now, in order for this to be a small deviation of the path that goes between these two endpoints, it must be true that eta of t0 equals q0 and eta of t1 equals q1. But that really is the only restriction on eta. So, um, uh, I'm sorry, not, actually that's not even correct, right? Eta, of, eta is the, the difference of the path, right? So eta of t0 must be 0 and eta of t1 must be 0 because you're going to be adding a little bit of difference, right? This is, this is an addition to the actual path. So the actual path will get you to q1. Alpha plus eta will take you off of q1, but we want to make sure that we start and end at the, the same points. The, the path is just a deviation of the path, not the deviation of the starting point or the destination. So when alpha is zero, then regardless of... Um, then, then if alpha was zero, for example, we would end up on the true path. If alpha is some small, tiny amount, we're still going to end up in the right places because of these conditions on eta. So this is how we quantify a variation in the path. So now q is a function not only of time, but also of this parameter, this little parameter alpha. And eta is just along for the ride. It can be arbitrary, an arbitrary deviation. That's what makes the true path so special, is an arbitrary deviation, as long as it's small from the true path, uh, won't change the value of j. So now we can talk about a f basically a, a value of j for a whole collection of different curves. Any va you give j an alpha, and it'll take this thing and vary the path a little bit, and it'll create a... Lagrangian value along that path, and it'll integrate that thing, and it'll return this value of j. So this is sort of like a family of different paths. Each of the member of the family is parameterized by alpha. It's characterized by this eta. It turns out that eta, though, is arbitrary, so it's not going to matter in the end. But alpha is the key parameter, because that actually, once we've picked an eta, alpha, once we've picked an eta, alpha selects one of many different possible families of paths. And we can calculate uh, this integral j as a function of that parameter alpha. And now, once we've done that, what do we mean by stationary? Well, what we mean is that the derivative of j as a function of alpha with respect to alpha, that parameter, has got to be 0. We're looking for that condition on this uh, integral. So let me rewrite uh, the integral in this form. So L is, you got to understand L is a function of Q, Q dot. you got to understand that now, and I'm just going to write L. And then um, uh, now we're going to try to calculate this derivative. So here we, uh, I just restated what we had before, and now we're going to calculate this.
It's just the derivative of this integral. You can swap the integral and uh, derivative. In this case, everything's well behaved, and these limits of integration are just numbers. Sometimes there's a problem if the limits of integration are functions of uh, some of the dependencies in L, but that's not the case here. If it was a function of alpha, that would be a bit of a problem, but not in this case. These are just numbers. So we have to execute this derivative, and that's going to be chain rule. And so here's our application of the chain rule. This derivative with respect <coughs> to alpha is the derivative, if keeping in mind that, I guess I should write down that L is a function of q, q dot, and t. Um, so you have to take derivatives with respect to these guys, and then th their derivatives with respect to alpha as in the chain rule. So it's L with q, L with q dot, and q dot with alpha, q with alpha. Now, notice if there were a lot of di different uh, q's and q dots, as in here, right, then um, you just keep stringing it along, right? You just get, uh, basically what ends up happening is you get a summation here, one for each of the different q's under the integral sign, and you just proceed uh, the same way. Now let's consider this integral first. We'll break it up into two. We'll consider this integral first. And here, uh, this, is, this is the same thing as this. Q dot is dQ dt. So I write this as a second derivative, a mixed uh, partial derivative. Right, that's how we're going to write that. Now we're going to solve this guy. We're going to integrate that guy by integration by parts. And just as a quick reminder, I've written down two different ways of remembering the... Uh, this is the one I learned uh, in, uh, in high school. The integral of u times the differential of a function v. The integral of a function u times the differential of a function v is the product of the functions minus the integral of the function v times the differential of u. Now implied in all this is that u is a function of x and v is a function of x. And dv is um, is dv dx dx and du is du dx dx and that's this version here u times the derivative of v dx is uv times the integral of v times the derivative of u dx it's all the same so we're going to apply that to this so let's see if we did that let me make sure I get this right this is going to be considered <clears throat> as, uh, see, well, I guess in order to make sense of that, I have to put a dt here. This will be considered v prime. This will be considered u, right? And so that's going to end up being, so, so, the uh, so v is going to be this thing so integrated out of, of t of the variable t so you're going to get dq d alpha and then this is just u so this will be so that this will correspond here to this uv term so u we've already agreed on is dl partial q dot and then v if this is v prime then v is going to be partial q partial alpha Right? And then that'll be taken from t0 to t1. And then from that, we have to subtract the integral of this guy. Oh, wait, what, what am I saying? What am I saying? No, we have to finish. We have to finish the integration by parts is what we have to do. Sorry, that guy's not next yet. This is going to be... Uh, so I, I need v, which we've figured out was d... Oops, go back to green here, sorry to which is uh, <clears throat> v was d q partial alpha times u dot which is the time derivative of this first term so that's d by d t of the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to q dot and that's d t from t zero to t one so now we look at this term here um, so I, I'm just evaluating this part of the integral, right? But let's study it, right? This term here, you have this, the path in configuration space, the derivative with respect to the parameter alpha. 
Now we remember, going back here, that this is an expression of the path as a function of alpha. If I take that derivative, I get eta, right? All that's left is eta. That's, a con that's not a function of alpha at all. That's the real path. So the derivative of this with respect to alpha is just eta. But eta at t1 and eta at t0 are both defined to be 0. And that's what the limits of this integration is. So this will always be 0. So with that being 0, what do we have left? We have this part of the integral, and this has been reduced to this thing. So, uh, and remember, this integration here is actually that one there. So I can combine this. Uh, I can put this back in here to replace that. Let me do that. Let me set this up. Put a little equal sign here, and then write the new answer. So this is the new answer here. The, uh, this term here, uh, partial q, partial alpha, and here's partial q, partial alpha here. <clears throat> so I pulled that out. And then we have this bracket, which in here we have actually what's the equation of motion ends up being. So this is the final int integral. And what you understand is that this thing has to be zero, right? In order that the whole, it doesn't have to be zero, I'm sorry. In order for this to equal zero, right? That's our goal. Our goal is that to equal zero. We need to find a path where that equals zero. So in order to find a path where that equals zero, well, this is what that is, right? This equals dj of alpha, d of alpha, right? A small variation metered by alpha. That, we want that to equal zero. Well, how do we get this guy to equal zero? Well, this first thing will not equal zero because that is just, remember, q of t and alpha. So if I take the partial derivative of that with respect to alpha, that's not going to be zero, right? That's, it was zero at the endpoints here, right? But that's because of the unique choice of, of the, um, this variation, right? That, doesn't, that won't be true for points in the middle here. And it's certainly not true that this is always going to be zero to make this integrand zero, right? So that's in, the, that's in the wrong place. Remember, if it's inside the integral, the fact that it's zero at the endpoints doesn't matter. It only mattered because we were evaluating it at only two points and taking the difference because that's the way integration by parts works, right? So that's not equal to zero. So the only way for this this to be true is if this is always if this part equals zero. If this part here were to equal zero, then the integral would always be the integrand would always be zero and the variation would always be zero. This variation would always be zero. So we now say that in order for the variation of this integral to be zero, it must be true that this thing is zero. But that means L, which is a function of q, q dot, and t, that means we need to find a q that satisfies, we need to find a, um, uh, a q that satisfies this differential equation equaling zero. And that's exactly what we mean by, where was it? That's exactly what we mean by this guy right here. So ultimately, that's where it came out from. And you'll see how very general and broad this is. This is a very broad concept, um, this, this proof that we just did. And in fact, it ultimately, uh, uh, I, we're going to do the, uh, the same thing, or we did the same thing uh, with, uh, it, it showed up in its own way in our analysis of the geodesics. Okay, so now that we understand those equations of motion, let's finish up the central force problem. Uh, oops, I just checked. I've run out of time. So um, we will uh, we'll finish. We'll, well, I guess we've done a, a, a few things. One is we've set up the central force problem, right? We set it up by understanding that we're dealing with this Lagrangian, right? Because it falls into the kinetic energy minus potential energy, where the potential energy for the central force is a, is a function of R only, and it's a conservative central force that is derivable from a potential. So that is our Lagrangian. And then we know that we are going to have to solve this expression for this Lagrangian. We're going to insert that Lagrangian into this expression, and we're going to end up with a differential equation um, that uh, uh, will give us uh, an opportunity to get at
the values of q with respect to time. And uh, we'll set that up next time.